This is my first uh, visit to Loyola, uh, quite impressive. Uh, both the history of the institution as well as the campus itself. Uh, so I had an opportunity to look around a bit. Uh, let me start by just saying a little bit about myself. I've uh, been at Stanford uh, for a very long time. I uh, started there in 1970 as a young assistant professor right out of school. And uh, at the beginning of my uh, time at Stanford, I actually, uh, my research uh, activity was in the area of uh, uh, chemical oceanography. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in civil engineering and uh, I have my graduate degrees are basically in uh, geochemistry and applied chemistry. So, uh, and over the years I've uh, uh, transitioned, I've had three different, uh, uh, actually five different research careers if you count my latest one. Um, and it's more in engineering now, uh, but with an application uh, in the area of, of uh, working uh, to figure out how we are going to uh, feed and house and clothe uh, the next two billion people on Earth when we're already pushing the limits of what, uh, uh, what the, basically the uh, systems can sustain. Today we'll talk about China. We've been doing a lot of work uh, in China. And uh, so I wanted to uh, spend a little bit of time then in particular kind of outlining, uh, uh, we'll give a little background and demographics so you have a little bit of a historical context of how China got to be where it is today demographically and then we'll look at um, issues associated with uh, water, energy and food uh, issues. So, um, as many of you are aware, um, the global population has been accelerating since about the mid 40s, uh, early 50s uh, from point of view of growth. And uh, this is a projection from the UN, a few a couple years old, but it uh, hasn't changed all that much. And the question right now, the best uh, uh, guess is that we will uh, top out somewhere between nine and 10 billion. Uh, we just passed seven billion globally. Um, uh, humans are the uh, most successful uh, biological species on Earth from the point of view of uh, being an invasive species. We basically has, have invaded every uh, aspect of Earth um, to our own detriment in, in many respects. Um, so, uh, but the issue now is the whole question of what uh, happens uh, over the next um, 30, 40, 50 years because uh, we have a, a lot of things going on with respect to climate change, with respect to the um, large uh, increase in population over this short time period. We're going to add two billion people. We'll see where they're gonna end up. And you can see here that in fact, um, if you go out to 2050, most of the increase is in Asia and Africa. And in fact, uh, it's projected that Europe will actually shrink a bit. Uh, and with modest increases in Latin America and, and North America. So um, you have countries like uh, India and, and China, which are already over a billion. Uh, China's about 1.4 billion now. Um, and we have an additional uh, phenomenon occurring at the same time. We have an increasing global population, but we also have a rapid shift from the countryside into urban areas. About two or three years ago, it was projected that uh, globally um, we had passed the 50% uh, urbanized uh, uh, globally uh, uh, in terms of population for China. Um, it passed uh, about that. You can see here's uh, the uh, world average. Um, then you have a lot of countries that are still quite, uh, quite rural, a lot of the African countries some Asian. So um, we have this phenomenon of people moving to the cities uh, and we have an increasing uh, global population. And the third aspect uh, is that uh, in many countries uh, we have basically uh, gone to below replacement from point of view of fertility. So we have 
a lot of countries, the European countries in particular, but also Japan, China is now below the replacement level. Uh, India is close, Bangladesh is below. So um, there's a lot of inertia in demographics. Those of, the, those of you that have uh, looked at, uh, studied uh, demographics, uh, you can be below the replacement level and still have your population continue to grow. Uh, let's look uh, uh, very quickly at China. Uh, China has a very unusual um, demographic situation because of the one-child policy and also two uh, major uh, events that occurred in China uh, during the uh, 50s, 60s and into the early 70s. The first was the so-called Great Leap Forward. They lost around 30 to 40 million people due to starvation. It was a, an absolute uh, economic disaster. Um, and we'll look at that in a minute. But here is uh, information on the urbanization of China. If you go all the way back to 1960, China was about 17% urbanized. Basically, it was a rural society. Um, many of the villages were uh, 500 to 1,000 people that were scattered over with subsistence farming. Um, and you can see that around uh, somewhere around 1980 or so, we had a gradual shift to the countryside and they just basically passed 50% uh, 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 urbanized. So here are the two um, phenomena I was talking about, the Great Leap Forward. Um, these are the uh, age distributions in the countryside as of uh, 2005. And uh, so it, it, it really has some skewed uh, aspects to it uh, because of both the large loss of population uh, during the Great Leap Forward and a, essentially during the Cultural Revolution there was a shutdown uh, basically uh, they didn't have a lot of deaths but they didn't have many births and uh, so that uh, affected and then they it went immediately around 19, uh, late 70s, uh, 1980 into a one child policy and the, there's been a lot of criticism in the West uh, for that. Um, on the other hand if you were making the decision uh, back then, if, if they had not done something to uh, constrain uh, the uh, increase in population uh, at the birth rate before, if we had that continuing uh, since uh, the implementation of the one-child policy, if that had just continued, there'd be another 400 million Chinese in China. So the population would be somewhere on the other uh, order of about 1.8 billion. And we'll see that, in fact, China has some serious problems from the point of view of uh, uh, arable land and, uh, and constraints on water resources. So it was a decision that had to be made. Whether that was the right way to do it is maybe debatable. The other issue is uh, China's working age population has been skewed. And uh, the most important thing is here, uh, you can see that the number of uh, people entering the workforce at the bottom is decreasing now every year. And uh, at the top end, uh, we're having an increase of uh, aging people. And we'll look at those ratios in a, in a second. So this is a comparison between uh, China, India, and Japan, just to give you some <coughs> sense of how uh, dramatic international events can change things. For Japan, there's a, an odd um, feature in the demographic, demographic distribution, and that's because of the loss of young men during the Second World War. And there was a, not only loss of life, but a very uh, low birth rate during that time. Uh, it turns out, just by chance, the spread there um, between China and India, so it has similar shape, different reasons for the dip in the, in, in the distribution. Uh, but uh, more importantly, if you compare China to India, um, this is distribution in India, and this is more typical, India is more typical of a developing country uh, where you have essentially 30 or 40 percent of the population below the age of, of 30. So you, they still have a very um, high birth rate, uh, even though they're very close to the replacement level, um, the population in, the, in India will continue to expand over the next 30 years. Uh, Okay, so here's, if you look at um, the uh, ratio here on the vertical axis is basically the number of uh, the populations in the working age bracket, essentially 20 to 50, 59, 20 to 60, uh, 
divided by people 60 years and older. So you think of this as an example. Um, here at two, you would have essentially um, two people working for every uh, one person that uh, is, is basically uh, not working. So you have, and these are just the older, elderly, we'll see in a minute, we haven't put the young people, the children that are not in the working age. So increasingly as we go into time, into time, the working population in China actually has to support a larger and larger uh, population that's outside the work age. And, uh, and in addition to that, as we'll talk about how they're gonna develop, um, the features of the new society have to be uh, dramatically different than we're accustomed to because they have to take care of a, a, a very large and growing population uh, that are aging. And this is a, another uh, kind of a distribution. Uh, this is total population up to 1.4 billion, but it, it breaks it up into the four categories there. Okay, the fertility rate, replacement fertility rate is about 2.1. And you can see China is uh, well below that, as are uh, Japan, a number of European countries, Russia included. Um, the red ones are all African countries, and many of them are still, uh, have fertility rates at, at uh, very high uh, numbers. And what we saw earlier is between now and 2050, most of the population gain will be in Asia. So a lot of that will be in India. Um, and uh, Southeast Asia, a number of the countries, and in Africa. So Africa, the African population will double between now and 2050. This is, again, uh, kind of this, uh, essentially saying the same uh, uh, type of, uh, uh, of data. This is a percent of total population over the age of uh, 60, and we're about uh, 15, probably 16 or 17 percent of the Chinese population today this was, those were data in 2013, so two years is probably 16% or so. Um, but it's on a pretty steep slope, and we'll see in just a second, it's, um, it's going to very quickly begin to rival Japan and Italy, which are the uh, two countries whose population is aging the fastest. Now China will be the first country in history, if you look at the countries all the ones here, these are all rich countries. China will be the first country that gets old before it gets rich. And that has to do with, partly with the one child policy, partly with the delayed development due to the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. Had development started back in the 70s, uh, or even earlier in the 60s, um, then uh, by this time, China would actually have joined the, the wealthy group of nations, and so that delayed uh, development by at least 20 to 25 years. If you look, this is the aged population, 2050 out here, and if you add in then the children, non-working uh, population, um, about 80% of the population, and this is ratioed against the working bracket, so that would, uh, that would be, uh, let's say, uh, Eight, at, at 2050, for every 10 people working, you have eight people uh, they have to support uh, that are not working. And so it's, uh, uh, it, it puts a, uh, constraints on uh, where they have to invest the resources and uh, uh, what uh, the dimensions of their uh, societies will look like. Okay, now everyone, I sus suspect everyone in the room is familiar with the uh, pollution problems in China. E even if you've never been there, you've read in the paper that the air pollution uh, occasionally is uh, not only off the charts, but by uh, orders of magnitude. I canceled a trip three years ago to Beijing, the air quality parameters. Uh, here, it's a, an emergency if we get two micrograms per cubic meter of particulate material smaller than 2.5 microns. I mean, that's a, a signal that says well, we have very bad air quality. At that time, Beijing was suffering air quality of 900. So essentially almost a, five, a factor of 500 times what we would consider an emergency. Uh, and uh, uh, visual sight at ground level is about two blocks. So 
Um, it's, it's very bad and can be on, on occasion uh, very bad in some, many of the other large industrial cities, Shanghai as well. So in that context, let's look, uh, this is a uh, so-called environmental Kuznet curve, which is credited as to a fellow Kuznet who first observed that this is kind of the pattern that developing countries go through. If you look at the historical um, set of data for Taiwan and, and South Korea as an example, in the early days when they were developing, uh, both Taiwan and, and uh, South Korea were actually quite poor at the beginning. Sing Singapore is another one. Um, so uh, environmental degradation on the vertical axis here was going up during economic, uh, there are no parameters on this, but, uh, uh, and uh, at some point though, the per capita income and national uh, income reaches a point where people are willing to uh, forego consumption or some portion of their consumption in order to invest in a higher quality of life from an environmental point of view. And so here are some aspects that uh, relate to that. Um, as uh, during low incomes, uh, pollution increases. At some point, uh, people are more willing to pay. We actually uh, went through that from a point of view, as we'll see later on, we'll talk about uh, water pollution in, here in the US. But Los Angeles, for the older people in the audience, will remember that air quality in Los Angeles was not so good if you go back 30 years ago. Uh, and when I was a graduate student, I interviewed at Caltech for graduate school, and I remember uh, the uh, faculty person who was taking me around, uh, there was a window that looked out on the mountains, which you couldn't see the day I was there. So they had a very nice photo right next to the window, which showed you what on a good day you could actually see, and they were only five miles away. But the air quality was so poor that actually you couldn't see anything. So uh, the Los Angeles Air Basin uh, uh, went through a, a lot of turmoil in the 60s and 70s, and it's much, much improved, as uh, we're all aware now. So the notion here is, is that developing countries basically are following the same pattern that in some respects we um, followed ourselves. So now let's shift a little bit, and we want to talk about uh, both food, water, and energy as it relates to China. And in some cases, um, we'll look at data um, from outside China uh, for comparison. So we'll do some comparison, say, between the U.S. and China, um, and partly because in terms of uh, surface area, U.S. and China are quite comparable, and the amount of actual usable water between the two countries about the same. The difference, of course, is in population. They have 1.4 billion people and we have about a little over 300 million. From a point of view of nutrition, this is uh, probably a fact that um, most of us uh, don't pay much attention to or may not even know. But if you were to list all of the uh, contributions to CO2 in terms of global warming, the production of animal protein actually generates pretty close to 20%. The data here, these are a couple of years old, where it was 18% at that time of the contribution, 18% of the total CO2 that is contributed uh, to the atmosphere every year comes basically from uh, husbandry, from growing uh, animals um, for nutrition. And of course, developing countries want to improve their nutrition. There's every reason uh, to expect that uh, China uh, will want to improve the quality of nutrition for all of its people, and that uh, includes uh, animal protein. Uh, China right now is the largest producer of pork in the world. They grow more than 50% of the pigs uh, in, in the world, and they just bought up the largest pork producing con uh, company, I've forgotten the name of the company here in the U.S. just recently, um, to increase uh, the uh, availability of that. So let's um, uh, talk a little bit about energy. These are data for um, the uh, US. Um, and uh, just to give us a, a context, uh, these are the uh, total energy uh, uh, dissipation in the US is broken up into four uh, areas. Residential buildings, which is about 22%. Commercial buildings, about 19%. So that is uh, if you add those together, just from point of view of uh, fixed infrastructure, uh, in terms of buildings, a little over 40% of the energy uh, is consumed. That's lights, heats, cooling, um, 
and uh, the actual embedded energy in the structures and uh, the uh, cement, the steel, and all of those take energy uh, to produce. Uh, and then transportation, around a uh, little, little under 30%. Um, in, at least in California, that's improving a little bit because we have more hybrid cars and electric. Um, and they're even putting back in place, I think, light rail. Uh, Los Angeles is getting a light rail system. Um, in the 30s, it had one of the best light rail systems in the United States. And I think it was Chevron and Ford uh, got together and bought it and tore it out so that people would have to drive cars. So um, we're slow learners, but we do learn. Um, so that was, uh, I think, an improvement. Uh, we'll see in the future. And then industry, um, 31%. Um, but if we um, just take residential buildings, um, how many here have uh, recently changed out their light bulbs to put in LED at home? Put your hands up. Oh, a fair number. Um, you should, if you have a smart meter um, on your uh, uh, power system, you'll probably, you can go online, you can look at the rates, the differential rates as a function of time, but uh, LED bulbs pay for themselves uh, pretty quickly these days. Um, if you get an LED, it should pay for it. It's a little more expensive. They last a lot longer on the order of 20 years, but they pay for themselves in three or four years from the point of view of uh, energy consumption. And if you look at uh, the uh, lighting years, 18% of the energy used in um, residential homes, um, LEDs use less than 30% of what an a incandescent bulb uses. So you save an awful lot of energy. You can reduce that by quite a bit. And China is uh, leapfrogging over a lot of these uh, kinds of technologies. So they're pushing LEDs uh, very heavily. Um, they, they, uh, uh, it, it basically never built a telephone system that we knew uh, 30 years ago, they went immediately basically to cell phones. So they never had uh, wired uh, landlines. And many of the other technologies that they will you know, implement over time will be the latest technology um, rather than having to go through several stages. The other um, big uh, consumer in the residence is basically heating and air conditioning. and. Uh, that's changing as well. Stanford's redoing its whole energy system. They're using ground source, essentially heat pumps. So they're using groundwater to both heat and cool uh, all of the buildings. They've cut uh, the, uh, when it goes online in three weeks, I, it's supposed to cut energy consumption by 70% from point of view of heating and cooling, which is the largest. Uh, uh. So a lot of these technologies will be implemented in China as well. Now here's a comparison, again a little bit old, but it, it, it'll give us some sense. Um, China's on the left, and this is residential building, energy use, uh, compared to the US. And I've looked at uh, major, some of the major ones are water heating, um, cooking, and we'll talk about appliances in a minute, but appliances uh, in China have been are going through a big transition now. In fact, uh, in our center, one of our uh, industrial affiliates from China actually uh, produces appliances and they are uh, pushing very hard for very energy efficient appliances. But we'll look at some data and how it's changed here in the US. For commercial purposes, uh, the comparison is down here. And you can see space heating in particular is a huge differential. But any of you have been in a lot of the old buildings in China in the winter can testify that uh, you don't need a refrigerator. You basically could <laughs> leave something on the table and it'd be perfectly fine, but it's very cold. Um, they're not well insulated um, and uh, typically they do very localized heating. So there's a lot of room for improvement in the old infrastructure that's already in place. On the new infrastructure, um, they're building, it's, it's uh, uh, much uh, more efficient from point of view of, of heating and cooling. And then uh, we have water heating, which is another uh, big consumer of uh, energy from point of view of commercial. Okay, so this is an example of what happened here in the US and is happening now in China from point of view of uh, 
things like appliances. If you go all the way back, this is for refrigerators. You go all the way back to uh, the 70s. Um, this is the uh, energy use per year on a typical refrigerator. And over that time, by virtue of setting standards and regulations, requiring manufacturers to produce a more efficient uh, uh, device, um, you can see that, in fact, the uh, state of California led the dotted lines are the ones where the uh, standards for uh, production of uh, refrigerators in California uh, actually led the nation and were uh, the ones here with new standards at the federal level came uh, a bit later. But in fact, um, the energy consumption went from something like 1,700 um, kilowatt hours per year down to, this was in uh, 2000 and I don't know, 2005, so that was below 600, so that's already a threefold, uh, more than a threefold change, and it's uh, actually um, gone down since then. So, in fact, we're slow, but we uh, learned to do these things. China now is um, beginning to set standards for all of their uh, devices that will require manufacturing, so they won't go through the, uh, um, this transition as we have. Um, they'll be able to already, right from the beginning, sell uh, energy efficient uh, appliances. The other uh, change here in the US that uh, was a major uh, breakthrough, actually was the state of California required uh, the energy companies in California to change its business model. So if you're selling uh, electricity as a commodity, you want to get your customers to buy as much electricity as you, as you can. Uh, and uh, they changed the business model to uh, provide a service rather than, so lighting your home, PG&E for a while gave away free compact light bulbs. And the idea was that you could get the same light equivalent from a device that actually used quite a bit less energy. And so uh, the change in the business model allowed the amount of energy per capita essentially per year to flatten out and really hasn't changed much uh, since about well, the blues California since about maybe uh, mid 70s late 70s and it wasn't too long after that that New York uh, uh, followed and the same but the, but the rest of the country unfortunately is using the old model so now in China the whole issue I mean China basically is learning by observing what other people have been doing and actually California is one of the states uh, that they look at from point of view as being a leader on these, on these issues. And this is the cumulative energy that uh, was saved over uh, that time period, broken up the amount uh, due to new standards on appliances, building standards, more insulation in your homes, uh, and then energy efficient uh, programs and market transformation due to the new business model. And this made a huge, huge, huge difference. Okay, um, this is a, a, a data that uh, shows progress in China from point of view of a measure that basically is the uh, productive output measured by GDP uh, measured against the amount of energy required to produce that output. And uh, I've used uh, Japan and the US as comparisons uh, Japan, because it has no natural energy resources outside of a little geothermal, basically has to import its, uh, all of its energy, um, has been very efficient in energy use for a very long time. So if you compare the, uh, as of 2006, uh, the comparison uh, it basically is that the U.S. as of 2006 used about twice as much energy, energy as Japan to produce the same output. Um, and China used about 10 times Japan and about five times the US for the same output. Uh, but that's changing very rapidly in China. They're upgrading their industry. Um, they're, uh, uh, they're actually right now the world leader in terms of installed wind energy. The wind farms in Inner Mongolia um, go on forever. I mean, it's just amazing. They've been working with the Germans in terms of uh, expanding their wind energy and they, of course, are the largest solar panel producers in the world.
Unfortunately, they overbuilt production capacity by about a factor of two, and so the economics of production in China is, uh, has some issues. All right, this population density this is a graph that requires just a little bit of, uh, of uh, explanation. Here we're talking about basically per capita energy use uh, in terms of population density. And uh, on the diagonal, it, we're um, a plot, it, basically it's any energy use per surface area. So that is a measure of industrial, think of it as a measure of industrial or societal uh, productivity, uh, given that the, most of the energy is used in some uh, economic uh, activity. So if we um, look at a number of countries, so we're way out here, um, this is a very high energy dissipation. Um, so you have countries like Germany and Japan, which are uh, uh, very industrialized, um, very, uh, uh, I would say, uh, probably leading the world from point of view of uh, uh, implementing technology from point of view of uh, uh, manufacturing and all. And then um, you have China, and this, these data are a little bit old, so this, I'm, my guess is, has moved to the right uh, a bit. Um, but China was on basically a par from point of view of uh, energy dissipation, pretty much with uh, Spain and the U.S. And this is all the way back in 2007. So uh, already at that point, uh, they were um, uh, moving very rapidly in terms of their industrialization. What about water? Okay, here's a comparison between uh, China and the U.S. Um, Population uh, during the period of industrialization. So if you figure 1970 up until today, um, it would be a time period where China has gone through the majority of its industrialization. 1970, basically there was an agrarian uh, society. For the US, it was more than 100 years where we developed essentially uh, from an agrarian society to uh, an industrial society. Population during that time period was about a factor of uh, uh, 10 um, uh, different. So basically China had a, a much larger population, but uh, essentially on the same amount of uh, surface area. So the countries are quite comparable from the point of view of uh, surface area available. Uh, China, unfortunately, about a third of China is uh, essentially desert. So if you look at effective surface area, it's actually much smaller. Um, and then renewable water is not very different either. But if you do the water calculation in terms of per capita, uh, we have about 10 times more water per person in the U.S. Uh, than China has. So they have to use their water much more intensely. And they do enhance the pollution uh, problem that arises from that. Okay, and I put this last marker down here because uh, when the U.S. was going through industrial development, actually a number of chemicals that were actually used at that time industrially were uh, less than a thousand. And there's uh, on the order of 3,000 uh, large-scale produced chemicals that are used uh, today in, in uh, industrial output. Okay, so this is uh, renewable water resources on the bottom here. So that's not going to change very much. Uh, but. Uh, what it shows is basically the uh, change in the uh, effect of the uh, uh, industrialization of China uh, from point of view of starting um, from 18, uh, 1985 down here up to today. Uh, uh, the projection is it's a little under 10,000 per capita uh, for uh, the, most of the population in China. So there's been a huge gain from point of view of GDP uh, over that time period. Those of you that don't read Chinese, and I don't, basically this says saving water saves lives, the billboard in Beijing. Um, north, the North China Plain has a huge problem from point of view of uh, water resources. Um, this is a, uh, an aggregate uh, measure of water for China. Um, you can see the total doesn't, has not changed much. This, there's a red line in between the little uh, light blue and the orange at the top, which uh, represents uh, not so much rainwater harvesting, which uh, we don't do very much here in the US, uh, 
But wastewater reclamation, which California is going to do big time in the next three or four years. Um, and in China, basically, that's the only other uh, water resource they have is actually using the water a second time. So it is uh, in the plans now um, to begin to implement, to build and uh, recapture essentially water and use it a second time. They're making large water transfers from uh, the south to north, uh, quite the opposite of what we do. We send water from the north to the south here in California. Uh, that's uh, quite, I don't know about here whether it's controversial in Northern California. It's always been controversial. Uh, but uh, during the current drought in California, um, I think we're all asked to conserve at a point where it actually is going to require people to do something real. I mean, I just looked at my water bill and I'm, we, we have to cut 25% over this next year. And we've been trying to be pretty conservative, but 25% turns out to be a big number if you were already being reasonably careful with your water. Um, so we'll, we'll see. But if we have another year like we did today, California's in, in uh, quite serious um, trouble. Okay, you can see over time here, the main thing to look here is that the um, allocation of water has changed and the industrial part has uh, begun to grow. Um, the agricultural part uh, has grown a little bit, but not much. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in the North China Plain because a lot of their water is coming from the uh, uh, aquifer, from a groundwater source. So in aggregate, water shortage in China, largest population, but it has about one fourth the world's average per capita. So there's already a huge constraint. Uh, more than half of the cities, and a city here is a, city, a population center of more than 100,000. Okay, below 100,000 would be a, a large village. I don't know, it'd be a town, but uh, let's see, Palo Alto, 70,000 to get a, a, a feel for that. So we're, we're, talk, we're calling a city 100,000 and more. They have actually by now, this is a little bit old data, my guess is probably there's, that's closer to 700. Because of the pollution, about 30% of the surface water is so badly uh, contaminated that I, uh, from my perspective, it wouldn't even be a, a useful for irrigation of agricultural fields because a lot of the rivers are running uh, up to 50% industrial waste. And you use that water to irrigate your fields, you contaminate the soil. And in some cases, you contaminate it per permanently. 90% of the aquifers in China are already contaminated. Surface water is easier to work with because you can actually get dredge and you have a way to uh, work with the uh, surface water. Um, in, uh, in the uh, North China Plain, over a thousand lakes have disappeared. And the reason is, is that they're pumping groundwater, which has gone down so low, basically the lakes are draining into the groundwater. And so these are lakes of various sizes. Um, but uh, uh, essentially, once the, uh, you overpump an aquifer, if it collapses, the capacity is gone. And in the North China Plain, uh, that's the case. The problem here is that we're basically drying out. You have acute pollution on the water that is still there. The falling water tables is a, is a, a, a problem that is not only uh, from a uh, water resource point of view, but it's a structural problem for railroads, highways, um, because the water, uh, the ground, uh, sinks, buildings uh, settle differentially. You have a lot of problems uh, associated with uh, uh, infrastructure due to the sinking uh, soil due to over pumping of groundwater. And this kind of summarizes a little bit of the, uh, some of the problems. And salinity is a, is a huge problem in the agricultural regions. Um, because they're uh, not draining away in Central Valley here, we we uh, drain our agricultural fields and they go to one location, which basically becomes a salt pond. Um, but you have to get the salinity out of the soil, otherwise the crops, those of you who are familiar with the uh, uh, problem of salinity in crops, uh, you have to keep the, um, the sodium uh, below a certain level. And uh, uh, soil erosion in the uh, arid regions of China and the US actually has become a, a major issue. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the um, uh, North China Basin, which is uh, in here. Um, these uh, three different colored uh, areas are the drainage basins for uh, the Yellow River, 
uh, the high end Hawaii River, uh, which all um, uh, drain in, into uh, the uh, ocean here. The Yangtze comes uh, uh, around the backside of this, and so it's really not uh, involved. But that area, the 3H area, uh, has about 10% of China's water resources, but about a third of the population. And uh, this is probably even more important because they have been using groundwater, pumping groundwater to increase the production of grains. And they're pumping from a, what we would call a fossil aquifer. So when that aquifer is drained, it's gone forever. So it's, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, estimated depletion time is over the next 10 to 15 years. So they've been pumping pretty hard. Uh, at that time, they have to go to dry farming or they'll have to bring more water from the south to the north in order to be able to maintain the agricultural output. So that is a huge uh, uh, break point when uh, they deplete that aquifer. And this shows um, the difference. This is the global average per capita for the world in terms of water per person. This is China as a whole, and this is the the 3H area, the North China Plain, from point of view of uh, water resources. So it's, a, it's already a huge, huge problem. And uh, they've been making up the difference here with, uh, with, by pumping the groundwater resource. And that's not sustainable, and uh, they're well aware of that. And uh, I don't know what the policy decision will be made, but they're continuing. They've made the decision to pump it dry and then to do something else after. Here's another um, uh, view, and I'm, again, I've uh, compared the United States. We're using about 77% of basically uh, water, about 77% of withdrawals on our renewable water here in the US. China is a little bit above that, uh, on the order of about maybe 83% or so. If you look at India, which is here, uh, India is uh, pretty close to above 90 percent. India has a huge uh, water problem uh, that is, uh, and has uh, also uh, major problems from the point of view of overpumping groundwater aquifers as well. One of the big problems with management of water resources in China, both in the short term and the long term, are, as we'll see in a moment here, excessive fra fragmentation. Uh, that is to say, the uh, the overview of various parts of the water resource domain in China is divided up in many different ways. And let's take a look at that. We'll come back to the slide in a moment. So we have 12 government units, different ministries and, that are involved in water resource management. And so it, it really uh, makes it difficult to arrive at any kind of a uh, consensus because everybody wants to protect their turf. So this is a, this is a political issue from the point of view of trying to find a way to manage one of their most critical resources. Um, the other aspect from my point of view is the issue of the legal system in that uh, rule of law is, is not uh, established um, and enforcement of rules and regulations uh, continues to be a real problem, both from the point of view of water resource but also from the point of view of the, uh, uh, the environment. And then there's a, a number of other things, including uh, uh, water allocations in terms of who owns what aspect of the water and who uh, can take water out of a, out of a resource. So all of these um, have led to basically a free-for-all from the point of view of water resources in China, and it's um, uh, led to a, a situation that's uh, actually quite critical. The last five-year plan, everybody's aware China has a planned economy. Um, these were the major uh, areas that were emphasized and uh, there's plenty of uh, financial resources being made available, especially with respect to water and pollution. Um, whether or not those get implemented, uh, we'll see, but there, we're now, what, three years into the end of the plan, so, um, but uh, it, it, it is not a lack of uh, typically of resources. And it's not even a lack of, uh, if you look at air quality, it's not even a lack of jurisdiction. One of the biggest polluters in China are the power plants and the power plants are all owned by the government. 
So if the government cannot make its left hand do what the right hand says needs to be done, then we're in serious trouble. And this is a big problem uh, in China in that a lot of the uh, areas of government actually are quite powerful and uh, have developed a fair amount of independence. And so um, surprisingly, the central government has very little enforcement power at the, at the provincial and certainly not at the local level. So it's very difficult for them to actually implement uh, many of the regulations. Okay, so China has a problem with food. Has a, a, it doesn't have nearly enough arable land for its population. Um, this uh, is a plot of uh, population density. If you include uh, the uh, arable land, which is the light colored diamond over here, uh, it's almost an eightfold increase if you go, it shifts to the right quite a bit. Uh, in terms of the population density per arable land. Much like the U.S., population density in the deserts is very low uh, and uh, very high in the uh, areas where there are uh, adequate water resources. Um, you're all aware, or you should be aware, that uh, production of any food requires a lot of water. So this is an example of the problem associated with uh, uh, animal protein, the amount of water, uh, this is uh, liters per kilogram of product. Um, beef is probably the most intense from point of view of water. Uh, even eggs, a dozen eggs requires on the order of more than 600 gallons of water to produce a dozen of eggs. There are a lot of other things that you can get data on. How much water does it take to produce an Apple computer or a pair of jeans and so forth. And a lot of it is quite surprising that there's a fair amount of water required uh, for everyday uh, items that we, uh, we utilize. So that's where we came back to this whole question of animal protein. And uh, if we go all the way back to the beginning, if the next two billion people are gonna have any shot at all of having animal protein in their diet, then people in the West, that is to say in North America and Europe and Japan are gonna have to lower in some reasonable way, the amount of animal protein consumed in their diets on, a, on average. Okay, China's solving part of its problem with food by essentially outsourcing. And this is a, a fact that's not very well known. They are in fact leasing land uh, in Africa and in Latin America, uh, even in some uh, Asian countries, but they're not the only ones, South Korea, and of course, the Arab, this, these uh, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, they all live in a desert, so they don't have any agricultural land anyway. So, um, but the uh, capacity that is being looked at from the point of view of, of China is actually quite impressive. So um, they are, uh, they have a big operation in, uh, in Ethiopia. Um, where they uh, lease land, they also lease land, of course, that has water. Um, and uh, they have a large uh, agricultural activity. They uh, brought in the workers as well. And they even built a railroad to get the food out. So there's a lot of investment in these areas uh, on part of uh, infrastructure in order to be able to produce the food that they are going to be uh, needing to um, expand the nutritional level for the population. Okay, let's uh, go through this uh, very quickly. What I'd like to do here um, is just spend a little bit of time emphasizing that uh, we, uh, we here in the United States went through the same problem. Before 1950, only a few uh, towns and uh, a few cities actually had uh, uh, wastewater treatment facilities. And most were very crude, just primary treatment and you dump everything else into the river and the lake. And uh, it got to the point as population density increased that the uh, problems associate, associated with doing that, both the public health problems as well as the nuisance uh, problems, um, got to be uh, over, overwhelming and the uh, federal government in the uh, late 50s and early 60s put into a, a program where the federal government would pay 90% of the cost of building a treatment facility, but it was only gonna last a certain length of time. 
and it was amazing. Everybody got on board. If you're only paying 10 cents on the dollar to get uh, a plant that's going to improve the uh, quality of the water being dumped in your local river, um, and you can see here that by 1972, there had been already 19, over 19,000 treatment plants built in the United States. And then oddly, if you go uh, to the next uh, couple of frames here, you see that actually the number went down. And what we learned was that if every village uh, builds a treatment plant, it's, uh, you, you uh, don't uh, take advantage of the economies of scale. And so, for instance, Palo Alto has a treatment plant, but it takes uh, wastewater from Menlo Park and Mountain View to adjoining towns into one. And so they have a uh, jurisdiction that in includes all three towns from the point of view of, of uh, how they raise revenue to uh, cover the costs. But nevertheless, it, uh, it made a huge difference from the point of view of, of the uh, quality in the rivers, the lakes, uh, the receiving waters um, that uh, and uh, by the end of this program, uh, more than 90% of the uh, towns and villages had some kind of a treatment facility. So um, the other aspect of that was the fact that uh, we have a lot of, of uh, industrial chemicals that are used. Um, there's, a, most of you heard of Scotchgard. The older people have. Scotchgard was a product, I think 3M, produce that, uh, as I recall. Um, that was uh, uh, to make your carpets uh, uh, so they wouldn't, uh, dirt wouldn't adhere to them. So it was supposed to kind of uh, keep them clean. Uh, it turned out to be a chemical that was a, uh, essentially a, a fluorocarbon um, that uh, was never intended uh, to become uh, commonly distributed in the environment, but when you clean your rug, the water goes down the sewer, the sewer eventually ends up in the ocean, and uh, very soon they found these uh, chemicals in polar bears in the Arctic, and nobody's cleaning rugs up in the Arctic. So uh, what they found is it got distributed globally, and uh, of course they, everyone in this room carries a body burden of these types of chemicals now, myself included. And so the consequence of a high-tech society is that we produce uh, materials and goods that improve our lives on one side, but then give us a big question mark on the other side. We don't know whether or not these chemicals are going to be detrimental in terms of health, um, but we certainly know they're not natural and weren't there before. So it's problematic on one side. The, uh, the, the benefits uh, generally are, are, are pretty well understood. So uh, the problem with China is that they started developing their economy when all of these chemicals were already there. And they uh, have to use their water very intensely. And so part of the pollution problem in China is associated with the point in history when uh, they started their economic development. Now what we discovered here is that uh, a lot of these, none of these are regulated. And there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of chemicals that end up in various concentrations in our uh, water resources. Uh, we don't measure them. But when we do measure them, they're there. And we certainly don't regulate them. For a while, EPA was being pushed to regulate increasingly more uh, chemicals. Well, the problem is, in order to do that, you have to measure those chemicals regularly. And a lot of the analytical techniques are very expensive. And so cities backed off. They said, well, whoa, we can't afford the analytical burden that this is being placed on us. So a lot, for a lot of these um, chemicals, we don't know the consequences. And the other aspect of that is that it takes a long time for a lot of these chemicals to become problematic to the point where we decide to regulate them in some way or to do away with them, which is what we did with DDT. So uh, both of those issues actually um, we carry forward in, in terms of time, in terms of our own society, because we're continually creating new materials and new chemicals uh, to try to improve life. Okay, so let's summarize this very quickly. Um, the one-child policy from the point of view of China is, is one of the major issues. It's led to an aging population. It's distorted the uh, demographics. So, um, and China's going to accelerate the urbanization process, so they expect to move 350 million people into new urban areas. That's about the population of the U.S., so they're proposing to build the infrastructure of the U.S. in 20 years.
Now, there aren't many societies that could do that, but probably China's the only one that uh, really has a shot at it. Um, but it is, for me, it's mind boggling. I, you know, I was trained as a civil engineer, so you have to think about all the buildings and highways and water systems and energy systems and everything, hospitals, schools, everything goes with all of a sudden moving a population into an urban area. It's very expensive. And my own take on this is that basically they're going to spend a huge amount of money and that's it. They will not be able to redo the whole system. So the, the pressure to get it right over the next 20 to 30 years is just huge. Uh, and they're trying to incorporate all of the latest technology on, in IT to, uh, to uh, make their, their new uh, urban developments um, so-called smarter. So that's where the smart cities comes in. The term smart's overused uh, very heavily, much the same as uh, sustainable's overused. But basically it's uh, the notion that we can use the available technology IT and all of our sensors and all to improve the quality of our, uh, of our cities. And then finally, just leave you with a little note that uh, we're not on the planet by ourselves and so we really have to accommodate other species from, poor, from an ecological point of view. Thank you.